these times when the, what we've been talking about so far doesn't really work. So here's an example of this. This molecule NO is a molecule that exists. Um, but our what we do so far doesn't really allow us to find a structure. So if we want to describe the bonding in NO, describe what's going on with the electrons, is it a single bond, a double bond, a triple bond, these kinds of things, we can't actually figure this out. And the reason is because if we count up the electrons, we get 5 plus 6 is 11. So we make our NO, oops, our NO, and we start adding our additional electrons. Uh, so that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. That's not enough. So we can take those down and make a double bond. Um, now nitrogen has an octet. Oxygen still doesn't have an octet. And in fact, there's nothing you can do to make this really work because of this extra electron. So you're never going to get things to have a proper octet in this structure. And yet nitrogen and oxygen are in the second row, which means that they should definitely always have octets. So um, all that we can really say is that this whole idea of what we call valence bond theory, this whole model of like hybridization and that they make these hybrid orbitals and then connect in particular ways to fill octets, um, doesn't work here. Don't, doesn't. It's not a good model. We can't explain these types of compounds with valence bond theory. <coughs> There's another interesting effect of valence bond theory. Oxygen, another interesting drawback of valence bond theory. Here's our oxygen molecule as determined by valence bond theory, by Lewis structure, Vesper, whatever you want to call this stuff. So according to that structure, the electrons are pretty clearly paired up. You've got pairs of electrons in sp hybrid, sp2 hybrid orbitals on each oxygen. You've got a pair of electrons in an sp2 bond, sp2, sp2 sigma bond, and you've got a pair of electrons in a pp pi bond. Yet, if you, have this picture here? No, that actually happened. If you put oxygen in a magnetic field, you'll find that it actually is attracted to the magnetic field, which tells us that it's paramagnetic. Do you remember paramagnetic and diamagnetic from the electron configurations? Do you remember what those meant? If something is paramagnetic, it means it has unpaired electrons. So when we like counted up the electrons, and then if you had like two electrons in the p, they would take up different orbitals, so that would be unpaired. So those unpaired electrons would be um, would make the thing paramagnetic, attracted to magnetic fields. This molecule is also attracted to magnetic fields. It's paramagnetic. But valence bond theory doesn't say that. It says all the electrons in the molecule are paired. So we need a different model. We need to think of a different way um, that molecules or the atoms bond together. And that different way is called the molecular orbital model. Um, so here's the difference. It's localized, the local model, versus the delocalized model. What we already talked about was a localized model, which means electrons stay on their atoms. And that's exactly the model that we did yesterday. We built uh, hybrid orbitals on the atoms we stuck the atoms together, but we kind of kept the electrons with each atom. Does that kind of make sense with how we looked at it? Like these electrons were from oxygen, these electrons were from oxygen, they come together and they share these, but the electrons and the orbitals stay on these um, atoms. The molecular orbital model is a delocalized model, which means that instead of saying, okay, this orbital from this atom is going to connect to this orbital on this atom, we say all the atoms come together, all the atomic orbitals from the entire molecule come together, and then we make new orbitals that we call molecular orbitals. And these are orbitals that span the entire molecule. So instead of just looking at an orbital on this atom and an orbital on this atom connecting, we say these atoms come together, 
their orbitals come together in like a big pot, and then we make new molecular orbitals out of the atomic orbitals that we came from. And that's the idea of the molecular orbital model. So now we'll look at how we actually build this and how we um, understand things about it chemically. So before, what we would have said, if, if we looked at an H2 molecule, right, like this, HH, before we would have said is each atom has a 1s orbital with an electron on it. So if we've got two hydrogens, hydrogen, we'll call them hydrogen A and hydrogen B. We've got two atomic orbitals. We call this one 1sA and 1sB. Before, we would have said is the electron in one orbital, the electron in the other orbital, those things come closer and closer until they can share those two electrons in both hydrogen's valences. Now what we're going to say kind of looks the same, but because it's such a small molecule, but it's actually pretty different. We're saying that these two orbitals are going to combine completely in this molecule, and we're going to make two new molecular orbitals out of them. And these molecular orbitals are made from linear combinations. A linear combination is simply adding or subtracting things together. If you, you can make a linear combination of a bunch of things, adding them all together with maybe different weighting factors, or subtracting some and adding some other ones. Those are all examples of linear combinations. So we're going to make our molecular orbitals out of a linear combination of atomic orbitals. There's only two possibilities here. We can add them together, or we can subtract them from each other. Those are the two linear, com linear combinations when you only have two things. You can add them, you can subtract them. We have to think about mathematically what that means to the actual structure of the orbital to add or subtract the orbitals together. The adding thing kind of makes sense. You take one of them, here's our 1sA, you add it to the other one, the 1sB, and the new molecular orbital that you get is kind of looks like the combination of those two. It's kind of like a combination of those two hooked together. And this one is called Let's we'll call it MO1, like molecular orbital one. This is known as a bonding molecular orbital because it shows the two uh, atomic orbitals together. That'll make more sense when we see the other one, which is the subtraction. We want to subtract these two orbitals. Kind of seems like you subtract them, there should just be nothing. But mathematically, that's not really how it works. When you look at the equation, the wave function, the probability distribution, really, of that orbital, if you take the negative of it, what you've really done is you flip the phase. Um, so you haven't made it disappear, you flip the phase. A negative, I run out of room here, so I'm going to move this a little bit. A negative of, a, of an orbital like this is actually the same as adding its opposite phase. And usually, we express these phases either with different colors or with shading versus unshaded. So an orbital can either have a positive phase or a negative phase. And like an, a p orbital, for instance, has one of each. And so the negative of a p orbital is when the shaded and unshaded parts switch. I think in your book, they always use blue and red for the different phases. Um, because it's not really positive and negative, like that makes you think of charge, and that's not really it. It's really just the sign of this equation, this probability, or this wave function, the sign of the wave function. So if we add this phase to this other phase, those phases are opposite, and they can't mix. They mathematically can't mix. So instead, what we get is an orbital that shows them not mixing. And we express that like that. This orbital has what's called a node in the middle, which is an area of no electron density, um, which is a way, and also known as a place where the phase switches from positive to negative or shaded to unshaded. This whole thing together is another molecular orbital. So even though it looks like it has two parts, that is a molecular orbital, this, this subtraction of the two orbitals from each other. And this is known as an anti-bonding orbital.
So now we have, we have actually three types of orbitals that we can have in a molecule. A bonding orbital, which is a stabilizing interaction. A non-bonding orbital, which is a neutral interaction, nothing happening. And then an anti-bonding orbital, which is a destabilizing interaction. Um, putting electrons in a bonding orbital stabilizes the molecule. Putting electrons in an anti-bonding orbital destabilizes the molecule, de uh, kind of breaks up the bond. So that's what's going on here. The way, another way we would write these, these are both examples of sigma bonding because they're just kind of just smashed together. So this is a sigma orbital, and this is a sigma star orbital. Sigma, the little star, the little asterisk is for antibonding. From those things, then, we construct what we call a molecular orbital diagram, which is a way of showing how these atomic orbitals mix to make bonding and antibonding orbitals that we can then fill with electrons. So first we start with an energy axis. You got room here, yeah. So there's our energy axis, low energy to high energy. On each side, we're going to put one of the atoms that's bonding, and then in the middle is the molecule. So on the left side is a hydrogen atom, on the right side is another hydrogen atom, and then in the middle is the hydrogen molecule. So the two sides, the left and the right, are going to have the atomic orbitals as they come from the atoms. And the middle will have the new molecular orbitals formed by the mixing of the atomic orbitals. So the atomic orbitals we know, hydrogen's valence orbital is the 1s. And so each is going to have one of those. And they should be at the same energy because they're both hydrogen and they should be the same. Each of those will also have an electron in it. Hydrogen has one valence electron. So the valence orbitals of hydrogen are the 1s orbital with one electron in it. So then we say, all right, these have to mix to form the, the molecular orbitals. And you always have to have the same number of molecular orbitals as you started with with atomic orbitals. So if you've got two atomic orbitals, we're going to make two molecular orbitals. We just talked about what those will be. They're going to be a sigma bonding orbital. We'll call that the sigma 1s, so the sigma between the two 1s's. That's a bonding orbital, so it's lower than energy. And then we also make the sigma star 1s, the anti-bonding orbital, that's higher in energy. And then we usually draw dotted lines to show which molecular orbitals came from the mixing of which atomic orbitals. In this case, they both came from the same because there's just one of each. And that's a basic molecular orbital diagram. The last step is to collect all the electrons from all the atoms, from the valences of the atoms, and use them to fill the molecular orbitals from low energy to high energy. So in this case, there's just two electrons. We can put two electrons in a molecular orbital. And there it is. So this is a completed, a completed molecular orbital diagram for the dihydrogen molecule. And it actually shows the same thing that the valence bond idea does, that uh, two electrons are in the bonding orbital, which we would say in valence bond theory, there are two electrons in a single bond between the two hydrogens. The way we calculate that is something called the bond order. This is useful in molecular orbital diagrams. The bond order is one half of the bonding electrons minus the antibonding interaction, or electrons, right? Ahead of myself? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ahead of myself here. Sorry. We'll go back and do that. The bond order is the difference between the number of bonding electrons and antibonding electrons divided by two. So instead of talking about a single, double, or triple bond like we would in valence bond theory, we talk about the overall bond order, which can be calculated by, based on the difference in bonding and antibonding electrons. That's way more general because now we can have fractional bond orders. We couldn't have that before. You couldn't have 1.36 bonds between two atoms in valence bond theory. You either draw a line or you don't. In this case, we can have fractional bond orders, and we can judge stability of molecules by that. So let's calculate this bond order here. It's going to be half the bonding electrons, which there's two electrons in bonding orbitals. There's no electrons in antibonding orbitals. So that equals 1. 
The bond order is one. That tells us there's a single bond between the hydrogen atoms. So in this case, both theories work the same. Tell us the same thing. All right. Let's look at the same thing with a helium molecule. So a helium molecule's molecular orbital diagram is going to get constructed the same way because we're dealing with the same types of orbitals. So we'll do the same, same thing. Start with our axis, and we'll put a helium atom on the left and a helium atom on the right, and then our helium molecule here. We'll construct our orbitals. Again, it's going to be the 1s. They each have one electron, or they each now have two electrons. Helium has two valence electrons. And then from those atomic orbitals, we construct the molecular orbitals. Two 1s orbitals mix to make a sigma and a sigma star molecular orbital. And then we fill the orbitals with the electrons. We've got four electrons to fill, so we count from the bottom up. One, two, three, four. And there's our molecular orbital diagram for a helium molecule. Now the bond order here, what's the bond order? It's zero, because it's half the number of bonding electrons, which is two, minus the antibonding electrons, which is zero. So zero bond order tells us no bond. Another way of saying that is we would not expect a dihelium molecule or an HE2 molecule to exist, and in fact it doesn't. So that's a way that we can use molecular orbital diagrams to predict what's going on in the molecules. All right. Now we're going to look at some slightly larger molecules. First, kind of do the same thing with, with lithium. But then we'll look at what happens when we start getting the p orbitals involved in these as well. Um, and if you go on in, um, in chemistry, molecular orbital diagrams are, and calculations are, are a big part of upper level chemistry because they, they don't, we, don't, we don't only use them to predict the structure. Um, they're also importantly used for things like electronic transitions, like when you excite an electron to go into a higher level. So they're really important in things like um, solar panels and research in that kind of a field because you want light that can promote an electron from one orbit to another. That's how you capture the light in a solar panel. So you have to design a molecule whose orbitals are a particular distance apart, um, and that's a big field of research in, in um, what they call solar sensitizers. Same thing with semiconductors and things like that. So using these things to look at the electronic properties of solids and molecules becomes a lot more important than just looking at the structures. All right. So let's look at the molecular orbital diagram for lithium. Okay, extra page here. So we're, again, we're going to put the atoms on each side. And now what are the valence orbitals in lithium? Are we still going to have a 1s on each side? Or is there going to be something different? Two S. Two S, right. So with molecular orbitals, still we're we're ignoring the core electrons because they don't really participate in the bonding. So we're only taking the valence electrons. The valence for lithium is the two S. So we're gonna take our two S. Other than that, this molecular orbital diagram is gonna look the same. One electron each, right? Because there's one valence electron for lithium. So those two S will make a sigma bond and a sigma star antibond. We fill those with electrons. And so what would you say about this molecule 
we can calculate our bond order, same as hydrogen. So you think this is mo this molecule is likely to exist? Probably, yeah, and it can. Our bond order is one. If you put in one more electron, we got the exact same uh, diagram again, but now your bond order changes, so you would expect beryllium to not have that same kind of behavior. And now we get into something a little bit different because we're going to use the p orbitals. One thing you can learn from this so far, or, or that you can think about so far, is that the same types of orbitals will always mix in the same way in the molecular orbital diagram, at least the ones that we're going to be seeing. So if you know how S orbitals combine to make molecular orbitals, you always know how all S orbitals combine to make molecular orbitals, whether it's the 1S, 2S, 3S, 4S, 5S, whatever. So it doesn't change. It doesn't change is the idea. So we're gonna look, we looked at the S, now we're gonna look at how the P orbitals combine to make molecular orbitals, and then that'll be it, because that's all the possibilities that we're gonna look at. We're not gonna deal with the D electrons, uh, molecular, or the D orbitals and molecular orbitals in this class. Okay. So let's look at the p orbitals. P, or p orbitals are interesting because they can bond actually in three different ways, well, two different ways, uh, depending on how they are oriented in space. So recall that there are three different p orbitals on an atom, and they are oriented along the axes, however you choose them. So there's going to be one going like this, and the, what we would usually call the y-axis, one on the x-axis, and then one on the z-axis. And if two molecules come together, or two atoms come together to form molecules, those p orbitals can mix in different ways depending on how they're oriented. So if they're oriented kind of head on like this, that's going to be a sigma type interaction. If they're oriented parallel like this, that's going to be a pi type interaction. And in both cases, you're going to have a bonding and an anti-bonding orbital as a result from that mixing. So let's draw what all those look like. So we can see that. One thing with the p orbitals that we haven't really been careful about drawing in the past, but becomes kind of important now, is that p orbitals have two lobes of different phases with a node in between them. So here's a 2p. And we're going to add it to another 2p orbital. And just like with the s orbitals, in order for these things to mix, the phases have to line up. So those two added together are going to form something like this. It's not super even. Try it again. A little better. Something like that, where this inner part is now going to be shaded. And that's a sigma orbital of the two Ps. The two Ps coming together to add at that main middle section. And if you want to see some nicer pictures of it, you can look in the book. And uh, if we have a second, we'll go to, the, uh, to a computer program and try to calculate some molecular orbitals also. But there's our, our two Ps mixing together, one plus the other, to make a molecular orbital. They can also, just like the S orbitals, have opposites, right? The, the subtraction. So the 2p minus this. Remember, if we subtract that, we're really saying plus the opposite, and the opposite is this. If we add those opposites together, they can't mix because the phases don't line up. So your antibonding orbital that you get from that kind of looks like this. <coughs> the outer lobes get a little bit bigger, almost like a hybrid orbital type shape, um, because of the repulsion. And you end up with this node in the middle. But that whole thing, again, is one orbital. And that's what we call a sigma star from the two Ps. So that's the anti-bonding way that two uh, p orbitals can combine. And that's a destabilizing interaction. So if electrons fill that kind of an orbital, 
that's going to help break that bond apart. It's going to break that molecule apart. All right. The other way that, that two orbitals can combine is parallel. That looks like this. You take this kind of a p orbital and you mix it with another one. You get kind of the combination on top and bottom because the phases line up. So that kind of looks like this, and this, and there's this node through the middle where they don't meet. And that's called a pi orbital. Notice we're saying orbital, not bond here, even though we're using that same language. It is comparable to what we thought of in the other, uh, in the other system, the localized electron model. We talked about sigma bonds versus pi bonds based on how the local orbitals were combining with other orbitals, atomic orbitals from other atoms. Now we're saying we're going to combine these all into molecular orbitals. The difference is the molecular orbitals can hold any number of electrons based on how those pool together. So we can also have the subtraction, the other linear combination, which subtracting that is the same as adding the opposite, which looks like that. And again, if we add those, their phases don't line up. So we get this kind of thing here. And, and the lobes, I'm not going to be able to draw it super well, but the lobes actually kind of angle away from each other a little bit. You can see a nicer picture of that in your book. It's actually going to have those two nodes. And that's our pi star, our anti-bonding anti orbital from the two Ps. So that means if you think about the three P orbitals, you've got one set on each atom that is pointing toward the other atom. That's the one that's going to do the sigma bonding and anti-bonding. And then you've got these two that are parallel. That will be a pi bond or a pi orbital. And then you've got these two that are parallel. That will also be a pi orbital. So for every set of three P orbitals, you're going to get three p orbitals from this atom, three p orbitals from this atom, and you're going to to in total make six uh, molecular orbitals, a sigma and a sigma star, two pi's and two pi stars. And that's how our um, molecular orbitals are going to come out to be. Let's see if I have the thingy here. So let's look at how that how that combines itself. There's actually two different ways that it will um, combine itself in a molecular orbital. For boron, so we've got boron. boron molecule, and another boron atom. First, same thing, we're going to set up the atomic orbitals. So we'll have our 2s here and our 2p here. Remember, there's three degenerate p orbitals, meaning three p orbitals of the same energy. In boron, ha boron has three valence electrons, so we've got two in the 2s and one in the 2p. The other boron... Same thing, we've got the 2s and the 2p. Okay, and there are the electrons. So we're going to combine all these orbitals in the same way that we've just been talking about. The 2s, elect 2S orbitals combine to make a sigma and a sigma star. And then the p orbitals combine to form a sigma from the 2p, a pi, two pi, sorry, and then a sigma star, and then pi star. Wait, did I get those wrong? I got those wrong. Hold on. They flip. They're flipped. Okay. 
those pi sigma, pi sigma, pi orbitals are a little bit lower in energy. So pi sigma and then pi star and sigma star. Okay, that's that orbital. So from our six p orbital, atomic p orbitals, we get six molecular orbitals. From our two atomic orbitals and the s's, we get two molecular orbitals, the sigmas. Something like that. All right, now we can fill up all the electrons going from the bottom to the top. Six total electrons. So we go one, two, three, four. And then these are the same energy, so they're going to get five and six in separate orbitals. Anything that's in the same orbital, just like with the atoms, you fill the electrons up in separate orbitals before you pair them because it costs you some energy to pair those electrons up. Uh, so now we can look at the bond order again. This time we have a couple more things to count. The bonding electrons is anything in a bonding orbital, sigma or pi. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. And then the antibonding are these two electrons in this antibonding. And that equals 1. So we would expect this to be a molecule with one, one bond between boron atoms. The other thing we can do with this is we can now write electron configurations for molecules instead of just atoms. And that would look like this. So for a B2 molecule, instead of saying 1s2, 2s2, whatever, we use the molecular orbitals at how many electrons are in each molecular orbital. Uh, so boron, we start with the 2s. So that's going to be sigma 2s with two electrons, sigma star 2s with two electrons, and then the pi 2p with two electrons. And that would be its electron configuration. Alright, you can do that. Remember, you don't have to start these things from first principles like we just did and think about every possible way that these things can combine. Any set of p orbitals is going to make those same types of molecular orbitals. And since that's all we're going to deal with, that's all we really need to know. There's one more piece of this that you need to know, and that is that, like I got confused up here, well these actually switch uh, halfway through. Let me show you. I didn't get the book up. Let me get the book up so I can show you what that looks like. So you can see some better pictures here of, of those kinds of things we were trying to draw. Okay. So here's the thing that gets weird. If I can copy this over. So to notice the change here. Pi comes before sigma for the first three uh, homonuclear diatomics. Sigma comes before pi for the others in that series, as well as for the heteronuclear diatomics when you have different nuclei bonding together. Um, the reason for that, 
which they also have a nice diagram of that here. Is that there's a lot of other stuff going on. There are there are symmetrical and energy concerns that if you take more chemistry, you'll you'll learn about that allow these things to mix. And when they mix, they get lower in energy. So you can kind of see what's happening here. Um, as you mix more 2s and 2p in those smaller um, atoms, the sigma 2p goes way up in energy um, with that mixing, and the sigma er, and the sigma 2s goes way down in energy. So the the s's um, end up bonding a little bit stronger, and so you end up with this kind of change in the orbitals, and these basically stay the same. That's where that that switch occurs. As long as you're kind of aware of it, you don't have to know all, all the theory behind it. But it's nice to have a picture like this kind of in your brain because you can cl quickly, really relatively quickly, figure out the molecular orbitals for any member of that series. So if we wanted to know, let's say, oxygen. So let's look at an oxygen molecule. All we have to do is fill in the electrons. So we've got, um, for each, let's say this is oxygen, oxygen, and O2. We've got six valence electrons for each oxygen. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got our orbital diagram already, so we just need to fill things up. Um, that's 12 total electrons. So we start down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Our bond order then, we've got, let's see, two, four, six, eight bonding electrons, and two, four anti-bonding electrons. So our bond order is two, which is the same result we get from the valence bond theory that, or the localized electron model that we're going to have a double bond between the oxygen atoms. That's what that bond order of two really tells us. This also explains that other thing that we didn't really get to, the paramagnetism. We can see here that in the oxygen molecule, we have two unpaired electrons. That wouldn't look like that in the localized electron model, because everything in the bonds and in the pairs looks all paired up. In this model, we can say, oh no, those two highest ones are actually in separate molecular orbitals. And so that's really what um, what's going on here. Okay, we've got a little time, so I'm going to try see if this works to calculate the molecular orbitals for oxygen. Let's see if we can actually see them. So this is a, um, a program called Cygris, which is a way that you can draw molecules and then run energy calculations on them. And one of the calculations you can do is it will actually figure out what the molecular orbitals look like. So let's see if we can do that. Which is going to be sp2 hybridized oxygen atoms. So that's pretty simple. We're going to start this <coughs> this thing. Let's see if it works. Okay. So we did that. That's done. And where are my Here we go. Um, let me get this bigger. So that used to be something that would take, you know, like a week on some kind of university supercomputer. And now we can just sort of do it, um, which is kind of cool. Here's our oxygen molecule. And it doesn't really look like much. It just kind of looks like some blue stuff around that. That's the lowest energy molecular orbital. And that lowest energy molecular orbital 
is the two S's mixing together. So that's exactly what we predicted. All right, so let's take a look at the next one. So that's the next highest in energy, and that's the um, sigma star orbital. So the out of phase anti-bonding sigma orbital. This tells us the energy relative to zero. So these are all stabilizing orbitals. These are below zero. Um, I wish there were like a quick way to do this. So what should our next one be? We're going to guess. If we look back at our thing, it should be the sigma from the two p's. So let's see if that's what it looks like. All right, so it does. You've got the two lobes given, and the two phases are given by blue and green here. So there's the phase out here and out here, and then it's a bonding orbital because they're mixing in the middle in that bond. So that's that second bond. Uh, we could do the same thing. Up there, there's our pi bonding orbital. Pi bonding orbital here has these electrons. That's one of them. So you saw it was kind of like this. That's the one sticking up. So the other one we should see should be about the same energy and should look like that. Let's see. I actually haven't done this before, so I'm kind of glad it worked. Okay, yeah, so we see the same thing again. Right? There's the other hydrogen molecular orbital, the pi bonding orbital. Um, the next one up then is our pi star. The non-mixing one, the anti-bonding one, and the other pi star. And then our highest one should be that sigma star. And there's that sigma star. So you can see the orientation of the p orbitals along that axis. There, there's a bunch of lumps because they're out of phase, so there isn't any mixing. And that gives it that anti-bonding character. Um, you can look at, oh yeah, we got to do that first. So, um, so another way, another interesting, let me get rid of this, thing that we can find out about this is we can run an experiment on uh, what we call UV visible transitions. Um, let's use this one. Now let's use the same thing we've been doing. What this is telling us, it's not a very exciting one for this molecule, but this tells us where this molecule will absorb UV light. And the UV light that it absorbs, or UV or visible light, just like we did in that copper experiment, this is that same kind of graph that we saw in that. And that, what, what's happening in that experiment, when you, when an, a molecule absorbs light, whether it's UV or visible, what's happening is electrons are being promoted from lower molecular orbitals to higher molecular orbitals. And that's causing, that's how it absorbs that energy, then they fall back down and release that energy back out again. Um, so in this case, we can click on this and we can actually see the transition. So the transition here, you'll notice is in the p orbitals. So it's going from one that is, uh, it's going from the red and yellow to the blue and green. Or I'm sorry, from the blue and green to the red and yellow. The blue and green is a bonding orbital, and the red-yellow is an anti-bonding orbital. I believe that's, that's what's happening here anyway. Yeah, and the red and yellow is the anti-bonding orbital. So, that tells us that what we're doing is we're promoting from pi to pi star. There's our pi orbital, the blue and green. There's our antibonding, the pi star. So when a, an oxygen molecule absorbs light, we're going to predict that it's going to absorb that light in the uh, around 200 nanometers. And that, that energy light promotes an electron from the pi to the pi star. So it's a pi to pi star transition. Um, that's something that you could that we can actually predict from this diagram. So I want to give you a couple other words that we will use. So 
that we'll hear sometimes, HOMO and LUMO. HOMO stands for highest occupied molecular orbital, and LUMO stands for lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So in this case, the highest occupied, that pi orbital, the one that's all full, jumps up to the next one, which is the lowest unoccupied. And so that difference between the HOMO and LUMO is a really important piece of chemistry, especially in things like, um, like I talked about solar cells or other types of uh, conducting electricity type um, applications, because it tells us how much energy it takes to make an electron jump from basically the top to the next open spot. That's something we can predict just by building these things on paper, even without fancy calculations. All right, so we'll use those. And now we can do this type of a problem. So we already did the oxygen molecule together. I want you to look at a molecular orbital diagram. You can build it yourself from scratch, or you can use what we've already done, and come up with electron configuration for each of those three molecules, O2, O2 plus, and O2 minus. So they're going to be very similar, just the difference of an electron. And then decide which one of those is going to have the strongest bond. So what's the bond order of each? So you can do that.
All right, got some electron configurations. Let's see if we can go back and look at our diagram here. So that's going to be our electron configuration for O2, just what we did before. Um, we just count up, figure out where those electrons are. Because those two pi orbitals are degenerate, um, they actually just get the same thing. We just put that there's four electrons in there. So that's right here. That's from part right there. And there's two electrons in the pi star. So once we've got that, we can figure out the O2 plus and O2 minus pretty easily. That's just going to be the same thing with one fewer electron. And then the uh, anion is going to have one extra electron. And these are other kinds of things that uh, valence bond theory or the localized model just cannot deal with. If someone said draw a Lewis structure for O2 plus or O2 minus, you just couldn't do it because you can't deal with odd numbers of electrons. It doesn't make any sense. The octet rule doesn't work out. So you have to use this kind of a model for those kinds of things. Um, all right, so all of these, then we can calculate the bond order by subtracting the bonding orbitals, that's anything not starred with the things that are starred. Uh, so that's 8 minus 4. That's a bond order of 2. So this one has one fewer Oops, not the right side halves. Right? Just 2 and a half in this bond order. So which has the strongest bond? O2. Yeah, O2 plus, right? The middle one. Just 2.5, the highest bond order. And now, we don't know what a half a bond looks like. That's fine. It doesn't matter. Um, we know that that's stronger than 2. So if you knock an electron off of O2, you would expect the oxygen atoms to come a little bit closer, be a little bit more tightly held together. It doesn't mean it's a more stable molecule. It just means it's a higher bond order. All right, so you can do the same kind of thing here. Again, same idea. With phosphorus, you're dealing with the 3s and 3p instead of the 2s and 2p, but it's actually the same thing. So s orbitals, p orbitals are going to combine the same way. Let's look at what happens um, for the last bit here when we have a, a heteronuclear diatom. Again, you're dealing, so in this case, NO, that was our example before where the localized electron model didn't work. So this is going to work, but uh, the, the only difference is that when we have heteronuclear diatomics, the more electronegative atom has slightly lower energy orbitals. For the same reason we talked about with periodic trends and all that, that you've got a stronger effective nuclear charge, everything's pulled a little tighter into the nucleus, so those orbitals are at a little bit lower energy. Um, so everything else kind of goes the same here. We've got our N on one side, our O on the other. Nitrogen has... 2s and 2p, and oxygen has 2s and 2p, but they're a little bit lower in energy, so there's a little bit of an offset there. Other than that, everything mixes the same way. So we've got our sigma 2s, our sigma star 2s, um, should move these up a little bit, we'll run out of room. We've got our sigma 2p and our pi 2p, pi star 2p, 
and sigma star 2p. Now, if you go on, uh, you'll know you'll learn in future classes that this is kind of a not exactly right way to build these things, especially when you get up into more complicated orbitals. You have to look at these symmetry considerations for how they mix together. Um, but this, as we saw with those calculations, and those were pretty high level, you know, proper calculations. We were able to make those same predictions, predict those same kinds of things. So with nitrogen, we've got um, two in the two s and three in the 2p. With oxygen, there's two in the 2s and four in the 2p. So that gives us a total of 11 electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. The fact that there's an odd number of electrons doesn't really matter, doesn't affect us here. The bond order, we can still calculate there are eight bonding electrons, three antibonding electrons, so that's two and a half. So, so that's what we were that we were, what we were struggling with before. All right, do we take that extra electron and make it part of a double, a triple bond, or is it just a double bond and it's on an electron, an atom? Turns out not to really matter um, because we've got we can do it this way and talk about the bonding this way. The other effect from having offset orbital energies like that means that the ones that line up most closely with the um, whichever atom are going to actually have more of the orbital of that character of that particular um, atom. So instead of like seeing exactly symmetrical atomic orbitals, they're going to be a little bit lopsided toward the more electronegative atom, which we kind of predict because that's another way of saying that you know the electrons are pulled more toward the electronegative atom. That's how that works in molecular orbital theory. The molecular orbitals take on the character, the bonding orbitals are going to take on the character of the more electronegative uh, atom. Yeah. Three. Oh, three, not three antibonding electrons. One, two, and three. So three electrons in antibonding orbitals in the starred orbitals. Okay, we can do this with larger molecules. It doesn't just work for diatomics. We're not going to do it. I, I don't think it will come up this semester. What you do is you combine the atomic orbitals, like for water, you combine the hydrogen orbitals first to make linear combinations of those orbitals, and then you mix those together with the oxygen to make the overall um, molecular orbital diagram. And you can do this, you know, for for any number of any amount of complexity. If they get super complicated, then you start using the calculations to help you. you know. And then when you look at really, really big things like solids, they're not really molecules, but we still understand it in a similar way. So if one atom has an atomic orbital, two atoms have these kind of molecular orbitals, three atoms start to have more, four have more, eventually all the occupied the bonding orbitals are at the bottom, and all the antibonding orbitals are at the top. And we can talk about those as bands, a valence band and a conduction band. The valence band is where the electrons are. The conduction band is above that. If there's a gap in energy between those two, that thing can't conduct electricity. So a conductive solid is one where the valence band uh, and, the, and the conduction band are meeting in energy so that the electrons can easily go from the valence band of one atom to the conduction band of another. And that's what we call a metal. That's why we talk about metals as kind of having this sea of free electrons. A semiconductor has a very small energy gap that can be tuned and controlled through something called doping. And then an insulator has that large energy gap that prevents the flow of electricity. Um, this semiconductor obviously is really, really important um, in things like electronics, you know, any kind of devices or anything that we use all comes from that idea that we can control whether electrons are going to go in one direction or the other. And that's how transistors and diodes and all these really important electrical components work. Um, and that, that again, can all be understood in terms of molecular orbitals just on this larger scale where they're called bands. All right, so um, good thinking today. That's a lot of stuff. But that finishes up chapter 10. We will have a quiz, quiz on this on Tuesday. And then we have our last lab tomorrow. 
last of the semester tomorrow. Um, one more exam, a couple more quizzes. Final and we're done. Bill's paid. Good job. All right, have a good afternoon. I'll uh, see you in the morning.